You're listening to the Future Tech Health Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Until I reached the age of 40, I never realized the obvious, that we all have medical issues, or we at least have a family member or close relation that had, has, or will have them in the future. Medicine and biological systems are the final frontier. Until we've conquered death, figured out how life began, cured cancer, and understood our purpose in the universe, there's a heck of a lot to talk about when it comes to our health. Future Tech Health means I'll be covering futuristic topics that are actually already in clinical trials or even starting to appear on shelves or by prescription or available for your own use. We dive deep into stem cells, CRISPR-Cas9, the science of sleep, epigenetics, medical testing, cancer, ketogenic diets, stem cells, aging, regenerative medicine, and more. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a serious medical problem. Remember, however, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you enjoyed the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and share it with friends. Thank you. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Future Tech and Future Tech Health podcast, and I have uh, Beth Tuck, Director of Science Education at Genspace. Uh, the website is G-E-N-S-P-A-C-E dot org, genspace dot org. So Beth, thanks for coming. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, tell me, what's the premise of Genspace? Yeah, so Genspace is an open access life sciences lab. Um, we are a safe and inclusive space where anybody from whatever background can come to do their own science, to learn some science, uh, whatever topics they think are interesting. We have workshops and classes, things like that for them to explore. Um, the real goal being to make this emerging biotechnology more accessible through hands-on um, hands on learning and dialogue about its implications for the world. So our, our goal is really fundamentally about making these really exciting emerging life science technologies more accessible to people. So who tends to come to GenSpace? Is it students, uh, like high school or college or professors? Yeah. Or who comes in? Our audience is incredibly diverse. Um, we are very fortunate to, in our origin story, have been founded by an artist, a couple of scientists, a journalist, and so on. And so um, many of those folks and more are represented in our in our audiences. So the primary audience that we serve is really adult, uh, curious learners. And so those folks are people like architects and industrial designers and um, high school teachers and um, computer scientists who have heard a lot about emerging biotechnology, but maybe haven't had a chance to actually do it or really understand what it's really about. Um, they, they often haven't had a biology class or, or some sort of hands-on biology experience for many years. And so this is their first kind of foray back into this technology in a way that um, is driven by their own curiosity and their own um, uh, desire to understand the, the tech a little bit more. That's awesome. Huh. I'd like to be there. Okay. Um, yeah. So what kind of things do people do when they come? Like, do you have preset programs they can do or do they yeah, propose so an experiment they want to run and you let them do it? or what Yep, you're absolutely right. So our programming falls into kind of two main categories. The first is our courses and workshops. And so these are um, courses or hands-on activities, things like that, that are led by experts in their field and anybody can attend. So you don't have to have any prior experience before you show up to the lab. Um, and again, these are really hands-on experiential learning things. So the topics range from, we have an introductory class, which is our, our standard biohacker boot camp. It's great for people who haven't had biology in a little while and keep hearing about it, but uh, maybe aren't as comfortable or familiar with the techniques or the vocabulary, so they can come in and get a crash course in how to actually do this kind of science. Um, so those are intro classes. We have advanced biotech classes, so things like CRISPR, Cas9. We actually teach people how to do that in yeast cells, and then we have things like protein engineering and you know next generation drug development, things like that. Topics that are kind of in this cutting edge emerging space. Um, and then in addition to our our science topics, we also have a, a really nice selection of courses that are in the bio art and bio design space. And so these are things like growing furniture using mushroom roots or um, making your own leather or paper products out of the, the SCOBY that comes from growing kombucha, um, things like that, which are a little bit more on the creative side. So it, it really serves a, a wide range of audiences in terms of our courses and workshops. 
Um, in addition to those, we have a membership program so people can join the lab as members and they can have, um, if, if they sign up, they have 24 seven access to the lab to conduct their own experiments, investigate whatever um, scientific question they're interested in within some safety guidelines, of course, um, and also to, to produce their own products and projects that they themselves find really important and interesting. And I can go into more detail wow. if you're interested. Mm -hmm. Yeah, tell me, like you said, making furniture from mushrooms. Is that <laughs> yeah, it sounds surreal, right? It's really, <laughs> it's really amazing. So this is a, a material that's grown in popularity over the last few years called mycelium. And it is um, typically when people think of mushrooms, they think of the actual like cap. Um, but this is actually the underground structure of the mushrooms, which is actually the more, um, more prevalent structure in, in most mushroom species. And so these roots can grow into whatever shape you mold them into. So you start by just mixing up some of these um, mycelium bits and, and feeding them some hemp structures, and then they're able to grow into all these different types of shapes. So in the past, we had designer Danielle Trophy, who taught a workshop on designing um, your own lamp using these kinds of mushroom roots as the material. And most recently, um, designer Grant Goldner led a workshop on how to make a, a picture frame or a mirror um, using this material. Oh, wow. Hmm. <laughs> so who, um, who are you tending to attract? I mean, what kind of uh, teachers and what kind of attendees and how yeah. is each class uh, marketed? Do you have like a, a list that you send notifications out to? Do you, do you join GenSpace and you get updates on what classes are coming? How does it work? Yeah, so um, our audiences find us in all sorts of ways. Um, we do have some teacher-specific outreach that we do to encourage them to come and think about how they can then apply some of these technologies in their classes. We get a lot of um, biology teachers, of course, but then we also get a, an occasional chemistry teacher, an occasional art or design teacher, um, both in the K-12 space and at the university and community college level. So last week, for example, we were hosting our CRISPR course and we had a, a community college teacher who came to take it to try to better help one of her students who's interested in using it in the lab. Um, so folks find us oftentimes just by Googling like science activities in New York. <laughs> um, but then we do have a mailing list that we specifically um, encourage folks to, to learn about our workshops and programming that's coming up. Um, so, and we have a, a pretty active social media profile. So please check us out on um, Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. And this kind of thing needs to be, I mean, in every state, in every city, really. Yeah, Do you guys have yeah. plans to uh, expand the concept? Or? Uh, that's such a great question. So um, right now we're, we're pretty busy keeping our space in, in operations. But um, what's, what to me is really exciting is the fact that this idea has caught on in such a such an exciting way. So we were the the first community bio, biology lab, but as we were getting started, several others were also in the works or had had started meeting up or other sorts of things that happened um, largely in the Bay Area. And then since 2009, when we got our start, um, I think there's something about 120 uh, community biology labs that have sprung up across the globe, and they're in every continent. They're in every um, region and people are really excited about this idea of making biology more accessible, more doable by folks who have a passion and a drive to do it, but don't necessarily have access to the lab um, or the um, mentorship uh, to do it on their own otherwise. So this is a space where where people really come together to, to science together. Yeah, most of the people that come to your classes, I mean, that's probably their, uh, if it's not their only experience in life, I mean, they'll never get them access to the kind of stuff you have in the lab there or that level of instruction. Yeah, yeah. We think it's really special and unique to be able to create a space where people can not only get hands-on experience, real direct uh, experience doing the kinds of technologies that usually are reserved for academic medical centers and research labs um, or industry um, uh, industry organizations, things like that. So it's, it's really special that they can come and actually do it, but also then that they have people who have a deep content knowledge and subject matter expertise that so they can actually ask their questions and get them answered in real time with people that they trust. That's really special. What do you notice about the people that come? You know, do you ask them when they're done, what was it like? I mean, you know, maybe combining survey data and just anecdotal things you've seen and yeah. experienced yourself. Like what, um, what do you know about the whole process now that you didn't know before? Yeah, um, we do do some evaluation um, through surveys and things like that. But I definitely think the more 
powerful data for us is the stories, the the conversations that happen as a result of people taking these classes. So um, the, you know, one example recently, we had a, a, a student come all the way from Los Angeles and she works normally at the Jet Propulsion Lab, um, at, but with NASA. And she came because she had heard about our, our, um, our workshops and really wanted to take the CRISPR class. Um, and then as a result, she ended up taking like five or six other classes with us and spent like two weeks here in New York, just kind of diving deep into all of the good science that we can provide. Um, and so she's bringing that back to her work, thinking about the role that she plays as a designer for the organization and thinking about the next step in biological materials and sustainable design. Huh. You, you tend to get more novices or more experienced people in the field that just want to have a different experience than what they're doing. Yeah. It's it's a wide variety. In that same class that I was telling you, the designer from uh, from LA was in. We also had a medical oncologist, a scientific illustrator, a science journalist, an ambitious high school student, and a lawyer and a tech entrepreneur. So it was a really wow. diverse group of people all in the same room, which again I think is, speaks to the power that we have in terms of bringing people together. Well, it's not easy to uh, entice all those people and to satisfy them with the curriculum. You know, so you don't want to make it too hard. You don't want to make it too easy. So what do you guys do in the class? Like, How do you uh, figure out how to teach, what level to teach to, et cetera? Yeah, I think that's a really great question. Um, so a lot of our stru- instructors really do think about ways of making their curriculum um, accordion style. So there's things then that they can um, be very big picture, very conceptual, very um, clear at the top level, and then there are ways then that they can dive a little bit deeper depending on the interests or the questions that the students in the class start to ask. Um, and so they do think about building the curriculum so that it can expand and contract depending on the needs of the audience. Um, so they they are very thoughtful about um, the content that they develop, and then I also work directly with them um, to come up with some of those strategies for how they can how they can um, make sure that they're attentive to things like vocabulary and language, which tends to be a big barrier when people are learning biology and biotech for the first time, Um, but also just um, ways of making the hands-on experiences really, really engaging and fun um, and playful and creative um, so that they get a a chance to really see the applications of this technology in in real life. Hmm. What about some of the experiments that have gone on there? What are some examples of what happened and how long was the person there? Yeah, so we have a range of people who use our lab um, as their lab or as their studio, and they come, um, again, from different backgrounds. So our typical uh, member could be either a scientist who has an idea for for a a biological product that they want to design. So they may come and just do some early stage testing of an idea, and then they may end up leaving, deciding to start their own company and joining a traditional incubator or a startup kind of accelerator program, things like that. Um, we have a fair number of people who consider themselves like hobbyists of science. And so instead of spending their time bird watching, they may bring their favorite fungus here to the lab to try to analyze its DNA and understand what species live in different parts of the of the country, for example. And then oh, okay. we have, yeah, so those guys, those guys are funny. They, they have a good time and they really just do this because they love it. There's a deep curiosity about the world around them that they can explore using this kind of technology as their thing. Um, and then the last group of people that use our lab pretty regularly are our artists and designers. And so these folks um, are very deeply curious about biotech and its implications for our world. And, and again, as I kind of said, they have a, um, often don't have access to the kind of lab facilities or mentorship that they need to, to really use this kind of stuff in their work. And so we have a pretty uh, decent cohort of community of people who are artists and designers who are using our lab as their studio space and, and really thinking about the ways to bring biology into their work. Hmm. Any uh, experiments or experiences that really stand out to you? Yeah, for some reason so, yeah I think the, the, the artists and designers for sure are the ones that have really compelling projects. They, they really bring a, a different perspective to the work that um, for me as a trained molecular biologist, I really admire the kind of creativity and curiosity that they bring. Um, so our our biggest claim to fame in the art world probably is the work that Heather Dewey Hagborg did, a project called Stranger Vision. In this project, she went around New York City and collected discarded objects, things like cigarette butts, um, coffee cups, hair, things that she could find on the subway, for example. And what she did was take those back to the lab 
extract DNA from those objects and run it through a handful of pieces of software that she could use to kind of predict what people might look like based on their DNA and use a 3D reconstruction, uh, 3D printing technology to print faces of what these people might have looked like and put them on display with their discarded objects. So you can imagine yeah. how it might feel to be walking down the street and see a piece of gum that you thought you threw away and instead seeing your face <laughs> on exhibition at a, an art gallery, for example. <laughs> yeah. it, it was, have you seen any correlation of the faces and the, I don't know, any, anything about the people that uh, throw away certain objects that tells you something about them? Does it seem to be accurate? Yeah, I don't uh, even know if you know, engaged. Yeah, that's such a great question. So her, her, her project was certainly on the art side. So it was kind of in this space of like, well, what if and how could we? Um, but there are technology companies, biotechnology companies that are using this kind of tech to, um, for use in, in things like forensics investigations. So the idea that you could um, potentially identify someone based on their DNA from a crime scene, for example, or an unidentified um, human remains, for example, that you could you could potentially figure out what they might have looked like, so that you could better identify them. Um, so, so her work was really taking a spin on on the technology that those folks were developing, with the idea of calling into question what does it mean to have a new era of genomic surveillance, and what does it mean to not own your information once you've discarded it. So these kinds of big social questions that, that arise when you start to think about um, the the connection between art and science. Right, weird. So what's uh, what's ahead for GenSpace and where do you guys see, uh, where are you going, where are you headed? Yeah, I mean, we talk a lot about where this field is going. There are so many fantastic, exciting developments happening in the emerging life sciences landscape, um, in the biotech space, in the biodesign space. And so we definitely feel like we've got a role to play in facilitating folks who, again, don't have traditional academic training, but really have a great idea or a great project or a great art piece in mind, and they just need space to be able to do it. Um, so we are going to continue to cultivate that community of people who um, want to be able to do this kind of technology themselves and, and make a space for them to be able to do it. Um, the other piece is that the DIY bio or community biology field is also expanding at a very, very rapid pace. As I mentioned, there are something like 120 labs globally. And over the last couple of years, there's been movement towards coordinating and organizing um, the community biology group um, and seeing what kind of role we can play in the, in the future. And as these, as these labs become more and more common, um, we, what, what support and what help can we provide to other organizations that are coming up? So, for example, right now, we have a project going where we have a biosafety fellow here in our lab, and she's been working on understanding the safety practices that are happening in all these community labs to try to write a, a manual or a, a set of resources that then, as new community labs get started, they have something to turn to in a way that um, isn't just trying to mimic the biosafety practices that happen in academic research institutions, which are very well equipped and very well suited or very well um, supplied. And instead really thinking about what are the needs and opportunities for good biosafety practices in community lab spaces. So we're really setting the, the stage for other folks to be able to follow our model in terms of um, how to best make sure that the work that we do is safe, environmentally responsible, and um, and helps folks meet their goals of, of being able to do their own science. So what if um, I want to do an experiment, but uh, you know, I don't have a lab and I don't have personnel to do it? Can I approach you guys and say, hey, I want to run this experiment and uh, I'm willing to pay you for the space and anyone mm -hmm. you can recruit there, I'm willing to pay them this per hour to run it. And do you ever do a situation like that? Yeah, yeah. So for if you are representing a small business, for example, we do have an option for a premium membership. And so um, that gives you access for, I think, two to three people from your team to be able to come and use the lab again as your space for a startup. Um, so we, again, would provide all the lab equipment, the basic plastic, um, some general lab supplies, and, and you could come and use the lab 24-7. Uh, so again, the, the process then is, is submitting your project proposal to our biosafety fellow who will review it and make sure that it, it checks out, that it follows all of our guidelines for best practices in a community lab, that we're not using any 
organisms that are going to accidentally make people sick um, and, and all the other kind of process and, and no chemicals that are going to, going to be particularly harmful. So she does check through those sort of things. But again, as long as it passes that safety muster, um, anyone can come and use this lab. Well, what about stuff that, uh, you know, would be a study? I mean, I, I, mm. a lot of stuff I know needs to be reviewed by IRBs and all that, but uh, do you ever get those kind of requests for those kind of experiments? Uh, that's such a great question. You know, it's been on our mind because we, we historically have never had anyone come to use the lab for anything that involved human subjects. Um, but there have been some questions about like, what, what role do we have to play in people wanting to investigate their own genomes, for example? And so do we have uh, the right or the ability to say, no, you can't investigate your DNA uh, here in this lab because we don't have XYZ approval or something along those lines. So there's, there's a lot of really good, rich discussion on um, what, what is the role of a community lab in playing um, on those kinds of research topics. To date, again, we, we don't do any, any human subjects research here in the lab. And so folks are um, encouraged to think about microorganisms or biodesign sort of projects if they're thinking about research here. Mm, okay. Um, any uh, future plans, things you'd like to see happen that uh, are not there yet? Oh, gosh, yeah. <laughs> so there are there, as many opportunities in the world there are. I'm interested in seeing us kind of play and pursue um, I have my eye on uh, a series of investigations that we might do to explore the microbiome of our local ecosystem. So there's some really interesting uh, environments here in our neighborhood. We're located in Sunset Park in Brooklyn. And so I have some, some curiosity to understand what microbes are living in our soil and how does that um, how is that influenced by the history of industrialization and post-industrialization, environmental contamination, things along that line that, that might be relevant for the people who live in our neighborhood? Um, so I've got some, some ideas there. And then, of course, um, longer-term goals of, of encouraging and increasing the opportunities for bioartists and biodesigners to work in our space. I think that they come to the table with such unique ideas and unique uh, perspectives that, that we really want to encourage them to to explore the tech and think about ways that it, it could be used and, and what it could tell us. Well, what if I wanted to come in there and like, you know, swab my nose or my cheek or <laughs> under my arms and look at my microbiomes? <laughs> could you do something like that? So we are a biosafety level one lab, which means that we only work with organisms that we know what they are and we know how they might affect uh, our health. And so for those kinds of experiments, um, we can't actually work with those critters. You could potentially swab them, but then we seal the plate. So you can't actually do anything with it after that in our lab. Now, you could, of course, do that with some other um, citizen science kinds of projects like the American Gut Project or other, other sorts of things where you could get that information back. And we could help you with the analysis. We have a, a strong community of people who have expertise in bioinformatics. And so um, there's definitely an opportunity to investigate the data here. Oh, okay. Okay. Interesting. Well, very good. So what's the, uh, what's the best way for people to, you know, find out more about memberships and check out a class and uh, propose an experiment and interact with you guys? Yeah, the best uh, way to get in touch with us and um, to learn about classes, workshops, memberships, um, outreach events, you know, fun social things that we have going on is definitely our website. So that's www.genspace.org. And to check out our social media, which is at Genspace NYC on all the different platforms. Um, so we try to update those those things regularly so that folks are aware of the great things that are happening. And it also gives you space where if you want to join our newsletter, you can sign up there. And if someone's not in New York, um, you know, they contact you, would you be able to steer them towards finding a, a similar place where they live? Yeah, definitely. We can help point them to uh, some of the other public resources of community labs, and we can also um, do our best to point them to other folks in our network that, that might be more, more close to where they are. Um, we do have quite a number of people who come and travel to New York to come visit our lab or to come take classes with us, so, so definitely want to encourage folks to come and check us out in person. Yeah, it's like CRISPR biotech tourism. Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> well, very good. Well, Beth, thanks for coming on the podcast today. I appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. Have a good day. You're listening to the Future Tech Health Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Until I reached age 40, I never realized the obvious, that we all have medical issues, or we at least have a family member or close relation that had, has, 
or will have them in the future. Medicine and biological systems are the final frontier. Until we've conquered death, figured out how life began, cured cancer, and understood our purpose in the universe, there's a heck of a lot to talk about when it comes to our health. Future Tech Health means I'll be covering futuristic topics that are actually already in clinical trials, or even starting to appear on shelves or by prescription, or available for your own use. We dive deep into stem cells, CRISPR-Cas9, the science of sleep, epigenetics, medical testing, cancer, ketogenic diets, stem cells, aging, regenerative medicine, and more. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a serious medical problem. Remember, however, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you enjoy the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and share it with friends. Thank you.